Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. With Christmas being just around the corner, I thought we would take a few minutes to examine one of the Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ's first coming to the earth. For this morning, we'll be looking at Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2. Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2. This is one of the more commonly known prophecies about Christ coming to the earth. <clears throat> it's a prophecy about Bethlehem and how the, the small town of Bethlehem would be the home of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Look at what it says here in Micah chapter 2, or I'm sorry, Micah chapter 5 and verse number 2. But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. That's Micah 5, 2. Folks, keep in mind, this prophecy was given to the prophet Micah uh, approximately 700 years before Christ was actually born in Bethlehem. Man, stop and think about it. 700 years before Christ was born, God revealed to the prophet Micah the exact birthplace of Christ. Folks, that in and of itself is an amazing thing. Just to think about the fact that a 700-year-old prophecy can perfectly come to pass. It's amazing. Just keeping that principle in mind helps us to, first of all, trust in the Word of God as being the source of God's truth. Folks, when we read about this and many other Old Testament prophecies that later came to pass in history, it's, it's one of the great proofs we have that God's Word is truly just that, the Word of God. It's the perfect Word of God that we can rely on as the absolute truth. And one of the ways God proves to that to us is through fulfilled prophecy, just like this one in Micah 5 too. But not only that, <clears throat> it also helps us to keep in mind the fact that God is in control of all things. Look folks, 700 years before Christ came to the earth, God decreed that he would be born in Bethlehem. And sure enough, God, who is in control of all things, then brought that to pass 700 years later. <clears throat> folks, it's important for us to understand that the Lord controls all things. And because he controls all things, we can rely upon him. We never have to worry about our Lord being defeated. We can never worry about our Lord's will not being accomplished. We never have to worry about the plan of God being thwarted by Satan or by demons or by any other one that might oppose him. God is in control. His will will be done. His eternal plan for mankind will be fulfilled. And this is just one small portion of that plan for mankind. To have Christ come and be born into this earth in the city of Bethlehem. And sure enough, he said it would take place. He revealed it to Micah. And then 700 years later, our God, because he controls all things, brought that exact prophecy to pass. Christ was born in Bethlehem. He was born to a virgin named Mary. Okay, let's begin looking now at Micah 5, 2 in detail. And let's see some of the many things we can learn about Jesus through this wonderful prophecy of his first coming. If you notice, first of all, the verse says, But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah. Okay, let's take a minute to study both of these titles that are being applied here to this town of Jesus' birth. The first title is Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem means the house or the uh, the dwelling place of bread. Folks, what's that teach us about Christ? Christ is the bread that was born in Bethlehem. He is the bread of life. So when Bethlehem is called the house of bread, what's that saying? It's saying that Bethlehem is the place where the bread dwelled. Well, who is that bread? It's Jesus Christ. Once again, the Bible describes Jesus in John 6 as being the bread of life. And if you study there in John 6, what that means is this. Christ is the source 
of eternal life for man. Christ is the sustainer of eternal life for man. Just like bread sustains our life. You know, it's only when people eat food, eat bread, that they're able to continue to live. Bread, in a true sense, is the life of man. Well, just like bread gives man their physical life and sustains their physical life, so too Christ gives man eternal life and sustains that life. Christ and him alone is the source of true salvation for mankind. Christ and him alone is the one who keeps men saved. We don't keep ourselves saved, nor can we save ourselves as fallen mankind. Christ is the one that does the saving, and Christ then is the one that keeps us secure in him, based upon his work on the cross. <clears throat> it goes on. Bethlehem is also given the title Ephrata. Now, Ephrat. Ephrata, sorry. What's Ephrata mean? Well, the idea is this. There were two Bethlehems back in those days. There was a Bethlehem that is found in the land area of Judah. And there was another Bethlehem that was found in the land area of Zebulun. The Bethlehem that's in the land area of Judah was known as Bethlehem Ephrata. So the idea is this. When the birthplace of Christ is talked about, and when the birthplace of Christ is described to Micah, by God when he gave Micah this prophecy, God wanted to specifically tell Micah which Bethlehem Christ would be born in. That's why it's called Bethlehem Ephrata. It's because that is specifically pointing to the Bethlehem that is located in Judah. What does Ephrata mean? Because we can learn something from that as well. Ephrata means fruitfulness. Or Ephrata uh, means to be productive. You have to remember, folks, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Ephrata. Think of how fruitful Christ is. Think about the many, many accomplishments that Christ performed while he was on the earth. Stop and think about just some of the things. Through his teachings... Through his miracles, through his life examples, and especially through his death and resurrection, Christ accomplished God's perfect will for his life. What is Christ's perfect will for Jesus' life? It's to reveal God to man. Not only that, it is to save mankind from their sins. It is to set a perfect example for man. It's to live a sinless life. You know, there's many, many, many different accomplishments that Christ had while he lived his life on earth. He was a very fruitful servant of his father. He was a very productive servant of his father. He perfectly accomplished his father's will while he was on the earth. That's why Ephrata here is described as fruitfulness or productive, you know, being productive. From Ephrata, from Bethlehem Ephrata, came Christ, the perfectly productive one that perfectly fulfilled the will of his Father. This prophecy goes on. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. Folks, Judah had thousands of small towns and cities and villages and hamlets. Out of all those thousands in the land area of Judah, Bethlehem was one of the smallest. Man, talk about being insignificant in the mind of man. You know, when they would think about Bethlehem back then, it was nothing at all that stood out in their minds as being any type of a great town at all. It was insignificant in comparison to most of the other towns around it. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, to be a ruler in Israel." This same Bethlehem that was so insignificant in the minds of the people back then is the same Bethlehem from whom the King of Kings and Lord of Lords would come. Do you notice he described here as he, as <clears throat> he that is to be ruler in Israel? 
Folks, one of the many different characteristics of Christ and one of the many different titles of Christ were given in the Bible is he is king of kings and lord of lords. And a part of that kingship, a part of that lordship is king and lord over Israel. Folks, keep in mind, <clears throat> and this is a very important point. Christ is the eternal King of kings and Lord of lords. He eternally rules. We see that taking place in today's time when Christ sovereignly controls the events of this world. You know, the kings of this world may think they're, <clears throat> they're simply making decisions on their own and they're leading their countries to do whatever they're leading their countries to do. But you know what? God's really in control of it all. Back in the old days, back in the Old Testament times, for example, you would have different kings who would think in their minds they're in control of things, and you, you know, especially the kings who were in control of the different world empires like Egypt and Assyria and Babylon, all of the different world empires, and you have the rulers of those empires thinking, boy, they're it. You know, they're in control of the world. What they didn't understand was the Lord was in control of their hearts. The Lord was the one that was really controlling them all along. The Lord is in control. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He displayed that throughout history. But also, Jesus will eternally be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Bible talks about in Revelation 21 and 22 how he's going to reign with his people on the new earth in New Jerusalem. How are his people described in the Bible? As his nation of Israel. Now please understand. The physical nation of Israel in the Old Testament is a picture for us. Is a symbolic representation of God's spiritual nation of Israel that we read about over and over again in the New Testament. Who makes up God's spiritual nation of Israel? Jews and Gentiles both. Anyone who comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, both physical Jew and physical Gentile, enter into God's spiritual nation, which is called the Israel of God. You can read about that basic principle in Romans 9, 6-8, Galatians 3, 26-29, Philippians 3, 2 and 3. There's many places in the Old Testament that talks about God's spiritual nation and the fact that Gentiles are actually... When they trust in Christ, Gentiles become spiritual Jews. So when we talk about Christ being ruler over Israel, what it's saying is this. Christ not only controls the entire world, Christ not only controls the physical nation of Israel as one of those nations that he controls, but Christ controls his spiritual nation and he will reign as king eternally with them in New Jerusalem. That spiritual nation will include anyone who has trusted in him, both Jew and Gentile. That's what it means when it says here that Christ is to ruler over Israel. It goes on, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Not only is the King of kings and Lord of lords the one that was given birth in, in Bethlehem, but also God himself was in Bethlehem. Think about it. Jesus was in existence before he was born in Bethlehem. And Jesus will continue to be in existence eternally. How does that all work? Jesus was God. God existed long before Bethlehem. So it's not a matter that God came into existence when he was born in Bethlehem. Not at all. God existed eternally. And Jesus is God. That's why it says his goings have been from of old, from everlasting. Jesus has always existed. What took place in Bethlehem? God came to earth in the likeness of sinful flesh. Romans 8 talks about that. How Christ came to the earth. He was God. He was born into this world in the likeness of sinful flesh. He became man as well. So he was both God and man. Living on the earth. Why did he do that? 
He was able to experience the temptations that we experience. He was able to set a perfect example for us. He was able to reveal God to us. But especially, he was able to die on the cross and secure the salvation of his people. Think about it, folks. God cannot die. He can't. If Jesus had not been given a human body, if he had not been given human flesh for a body, he could not have died on the cross. But it's when he was given human flesh that that human part of Christ was able to be given on the cross. The physical life that his physical body contained, he could then give. So God didn't die on the cross. Jesus, the God-man, gave his life on the cross. He gave his physical life on the cross. Jesus still existed as God. The minute he physically died, we see him ascending to heaven to be with his Father. He continued to exist. He was God. But his physical life is what he gave on the cross. That part of him that he received at Bethlehem. The physical nature, if you can put it that way. The physical flesh that he had. Is what he gave on the cross. That life that he possessed. The physical life that he possessed. Why? Because he is God. So stop and think about it folks. When we read about this prophecy we're told that. Christ is the bread of life. Christ is the fruitful one that bore perfectly the fruits his father desired for him to bear. We learn that he is king of kings and lord of lords eternally and here we find that he was God himself. Do you see all the different truths we can learn about Christ just in this one prophecy that is normally linked to the Christmas holiday season? Folks, that's why it's important for us as Christians to remember what's the whole basic principle behind Christmas. And believe me, we all understand Christ was not born in December. He wasn't. He was probably born in the fall of the year, maybe late summer, early fall, something in there. If you study the Bible, you'll see that that's basically when he was actually born. But the world has set aside December 25th to remember that birth. So as Christians, what is our main responsibility during this time of year that the world has set aside to remember the birth of Christ? It's to keep our minds on Christ. Folks, Christmas isn't really about Santa Claus. It's not really about giving gifts. It's not really about socializing and having parties. What's Christmas really all about? Jesus Christ's birth in Bethlehem. God becoming man who then became the Savior of his people. So as Christians, our major responsibility above all else when it comes to Christmas isn't to be sure that we have Santa Claus appearing on December 25th for the kids. That's not our main responsibility. Our main responsibility isn't to be sure we have plenty of parties for people to come and celebrate. Our main responsibility isn't to be sure we give gifts to everybody we know and not forget anybody. Do you know what our main responsibility is as Christians concerning Christmas? Keeping our minds on what Christ has done for us. And then out of appreciative hearts, sharing that message with others. Folks, the Christmas season is the perfect time to be a testimony for Christ. Why do I say that? It seems as if the world in general is much more receptive to us speaking about Jesus during this time of year than any other time of year. Simply because of Christmas and the idea of the whole world celebrating Christmas, it, it seems like people's minds and attitudes are more open to hearing the gospel message and hearing what Christ has done for them during this time of year than any other time of year. So Christians, let's not lose that opportunity we've been given. 
This is the perfect opportunity this time of year to share Christ with others. We need to do that because that's really what Christmas is all about. It's about Christ. And it's about what he's done for us. Being the bread of life. Being the one who perfectly fulfilled the will of his father. Being the king of kings and lord of lords. And finally being God himself. Folks, that's the wonderful Lord that was physically born in the city of Bethlehem. That's the physical Lord that we should be thinking about and remembering and talking about as we enter into this holiday season. So folks, I trust this has been a blessing to you as we've taken just a few moments to look at this one prophecy about Jesus. Hopefully to remind us of all the wonderful things he's done for us. To remind us of the great Lord that we serve. And finally to remind us of the need to keep our minds on the Lord. And tell others about him during this time of year. May the Lord bless you as you study his word.